by news media, the confrontation of truth with the January 6th hearings. It's a week in which we've had to look at ourselves, to say, who are we as a nation and as a culture? What are we doing with our heritage? What is the vision that we are pursuing? What is the purpose of all that we see happening before us? And so it caused me to think, since I was speaking today, about the church. And I came to the conclusion that the church, in so many ways, is in crisis. It's always the task of the church to take the essence of the Christian faith and to hold on faithfully to that essence as we go from one historic moment to another. What spoke to the church in the first century will not speak to the church in the 21st century. What spoke to us when we were children does not speak to us as adults. And so we are constantly having to revisit the essence of what we believe and the message that we hope to proclaim, always looking to how faithful it is to the essence of what the good news is supposed to be about, and at the same time, how relevant it is to the moment in which we find ourselves. Now, with technological advances, with the advent of Zoom and teletherapy and teleworship and tele-everything, we have a new challenge and a new opportunity to re-examine ourselves again. And that's exactly what this congregation and other congregations are doing. But I wondered to myself, is this just something that I'm imagining or is this in fact real? I mean, is the church really in crisis or is that just Lance projecting his own sense of crisis onto the church. So I went back and did some research this week. It was 1937 when the Gallup poll first researched church membership in the United States. And in 1937, 73% of Americans reported that they were involved in the life of organized religion and a community of faith, 73%. And that held pretty well for about six decades. By the end of the 21st, by the end of the 20th century, it was down to 62%. So around the year 2002, uh, we had 62%, and then that dropped recently to 49%. So that for the first time in the history of the Gallup poll researching, it was the minority of Americans who were committed to and involved in the life of the church, resulting in the fact that literally thousands of churches close every year in the United States. One of the churches in our own southeast district of the, uh, the Penn Southeast Conference is now ready to close. Another, as I spoke to one of their members, has less than 10 people who are members, not just 10 people who are attending, 10 people who are members. And so I thought to myself, well, it's not my fantasy then. There are things that are really happening that we have the statistical evidence to support, none of which tells us necessarily why. 
Another interesting statistic that the Gallup poll research showed was that 21%, this was as of 2020, 20, uh, 2020, 20, 21% of Americans have no religious affiliation at all, no, no preference, nothing. It's not like they used to be members of a church and now they're not. They, they just have no significant attitude, no approach to religion at all. That's one in every five Americans. So that the whole idea of a religious organization or a church is not even in their consciousness. So that there's been movement away from the whole re organized religion orientation to life. Now what's interesting, though I don't have the statistics on this, is that most of the research also shows that people consider themselves spiritual. And that that seems to be on the rise. That people consider themselves spiritual, but are moving more and more away from the church and organized religion. An interesting phenomenon. And so, I thought to myself, something I do rather often, I wonder if people still, as the 19th century theologian Schleiermacher said, still have a sense and taste for the infinite, but they have no place to go for, with it. Because the churches, as they understand church to be, are not a place for they feel free to be themselves openly, honestly, authentically, unfettered by dogma and unfettered by doctrine. There's not a place where they feel like they are accepted or valued or belong. The Methodist Church, for example, is now considering reversing its stand as an open and affirming denomination. And there may be a split in the United Methodist Church over an issue that we settled here decades ago. The evangelicals are more and more aligned with the kind of scene that we saw in the January 6th presentation. Because the evangelicals are able to claim that they are on the side of those who are disenfranchised. And those who are disenfranchised, in their view, are white males in the United States who see on the horizon that in the not too distant future, white America may be minority America. And so they have gathered together a combination of nationalistic attitudes and religious concepts that can justify the stands that take away the rights of women to control their own bodies, that allow for the undermining of the election process, that allow for the gerrymandering of political districts so that the white males make America great again can maintain control, even if the vast majority of Americans are against the stands they take. It's an interesting phenomenon in itself that, that the evangelical church and the extreme right-wing political movement feel that comfortable with one another. Another reason why those who feel themselves to be truly spiritual believe there's no place to go. And the progressive movement, of which we are a part, seems strangely silent in so many ways and unknown. How many times have any of you heard someone say, I didn't know a church like yours existed. I didn't know there was a church like this one. And that's a tragedy that they don't know that there is a place they can go and they can find 
that expression of spiritual reality in the context of loving community. How many people who are gay, transgendered, know they can come here? As opposed to those who believe that there's no such place for them in organized religion. How many women who have been suppressed know that there is a place like this one where we believe that in Christ there's neither male nor female, slave nor free, Greek nor Jew, who don't even know that we exist? And how many of us have really stopped to ask ourselves, what is it we truly do stand for? Who are we as a congregation, as a loving community, as a beloved community? What is it that we stand for? And so I found myself going back to what my colleagues in college and graduate school used to say, becoming the guy who turns mountains into molehills. And I think that that's really the way we need to look at our faith, because I think that's what Jesus did. I think Jesus took a look at all the laws of Israel, all the laws of the Torah, with great respect and appreciation for the heritage that brought them into being, and took that mountain of rules and turned it into the molehill of two statements. Love God and love your neighbor. And so is an exercise that I thought you might tolerate with me. And I really am asking for your tolerance. I developed what I thought were 12 principles of the Christian faith that I wanted to share with you pretty much for your discussion and for your reflection. And maybe we can do some of that in the fellowship time. Now what inspired this was Paul's statement in Athens when he had this to say to them. Paul, speaking to the Athenians, said to them, I see how extremely spiritual you are in every way. For as I went through the city and looked carefully at the objects of your worship, I found among them an altar with the inscription to an unknown God. What therefore you worship is unknown, this I proclaim to you. The God who made the world and everything in it he who is Lord of heaven and earth does not live in shrines made by human hands, nor is he served by human hands as though he needed anything, since he himself gives to all mortals life and breath and all things. From one essence he made all people to inhabit the whole earth, and he allotted the times of their existence and the boundaries of the places where they would live so that they would search for God and perhaps feel after him and find him, though indeed he is never far from each one of us. For in God we live and move and have our being as even some of your own poets have said, for we too are his offspring. Since we are God's offspring, children of God, we ought not to think of God as like gold or silver or stone or any other thing, an image formed by the art and the imagination of mortals. Now may we be blessed by this scripture. 
Because what Paul was saying is an amazing insight for a first century thinker. God is that in which we live and move and have our being. God is not a being, God is not a thing. God is not even anything you can imagine. God is beyond all that. As J.B. Phillips once said, your God is way too small. God is the very essence and source and ground of life itself. And that becomes important to us because this is what Jesus understood when he said, the kingdom of God is within you. So given this inspiration by scripture and given my concern for the state of the church, I decided that we ought to take a look at what I consider to be these fundamental tenets of Christian faith. Number one, God is love, and those who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. I think that's the affirmation of Scripture. Oh, and incidentally, no tenet of the Christian faith cannot be grounded in scripture and history. So we're staying faithful to the faith, the essence of the faith, while we're relevant to the moment. So tenet number one, God is love, and those who live in love live in God, and God lives in them. Number two, so the law of life is fulfilled when we love God and love one another. Jesus' statement to the young lawyer. Number three, those who say they love God but do not love others are living out a lie, especially a lie to themselves. Letter of John. Because number four, how can one love God whom we do not see or even fully imagine if we do not love the other who we do see and it's available to us for a personal relationship. And for the Christian, number five, this is what we have seen in the life and teachings of Jesus. Number six, so Jesus is the paradigm for the way to live life, the truth about authentic life, and the meaning of life itself. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Number seven, Jesus has taught us the distinction between heaven and earth, between God and humanity, between life and death is a false distinction. Because the kingdom of God, the kingdom of love is not out there somewhere, somewhere beyond the clouds, but within us. Therefore, number eight, God's will, the way of love, is to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus' prayer. Because, number nine, as Paul came to understand it, all of reality lives and moves and has its being in God, the ground of all being, and nothing, not even death, can separate us from the love of God. So number 10, All fears are overcome because perfect love casts out fears. Fears that I'm inadequate. Fears that I'm not acceptable. Fears that I am unworthy. Fears that I'm beyond redemption. All fears are cast out 
because perfect love casts out fear. Given this, number 11, Christian faith calls us to a ministry of reconciliation. The God who is love making his appeal to meaningful life through us. We now have this ministry of reconciliation, God making his appeal through us. So finally, number 12, faith becomes not a set of dogmas about the lesser things, rise up for church of God, have done with lesser things, but rather becomes the Christian's way of being in the world. Faith is a way of being. The way of acceptance and valuing. The way of welcoming and encouraging. The way of knowing and caring. The way of giving and sharing, the way of serving and loving. So that peace and justice become the norm and God's will, the will of love is done on earth as it is in heaven. And what does the Christian say in response to the call? I am here, God. Let justice and peace and love begin with me. May it be so. Think about this as we move to the communion table and to the celebration of communion. Our communion hymn is number 406 in your hymnals.